Namaste. So here I am on another morning walk, and this will be my last one here in Tiru for a while. Let's take a look at that hill. So um, Matt made a very good comment, excellent comment really, by email. Didn't show up here. He said, today's enlightened teachers have a habit of just talking about whatever the last teaching that they went through. <laughs> Maybe he's talking about me. I don't know. <laughs> I certainly have done it uh, and still do. And he says, as a result, their teachings are not context insensitive enough to help the broad majority of people. I think I quoted it pretty well there. What do you think, Matt? This is certainly true. And I brought this up again and again in some of the earlier videos. Some people want to teach only, you know, like <laughs> what was in the last intensive they went through or what was the last subject they went through. And they're not really addressing the needs of the whole spectrum. And that's why I think this uh, four darshanas is such an important concept, because it covers the entire range of spiritual teaching. There's a lot that I could say about it, but really I want to encourage you to think it, think for yourself using these categories. Every teaching, or actually everything that you come across, will go into one of these five buckets. Pashu, or Dvaita Vada, Vishishta Dvaita Vada, uh, Vivarta Vada, or Ajata Vada. So, as far as we know, at least in recent times, only Ramana Maharshi and Chandrasekharendra Saraswati are uh, on the Ajatta platform. But we see that they teach mostly on the Vivartavada platform. And that goes all the way back to Shankara. Shankaracharya, he himself said this, that the truth is ajatta. But the teaching has to be vivarta. Why? Because we see the world. <laughs> the ajatavadi doesn't see the world. The ajatavadi sees only consciousness, only Brahman, everywhere, in everything. So for him, the world doesn't exist. It was never born, it was never created. It's just an appearance, like a TV show or a movie. Huh? So, not to be taken very seriously. <laughs> but does that view help the majority of people? No way. The majority of people are more or less like animals. And so they need a teaching that's going to elevate them, that's going to bring them out of the mud and into actual human life. So the Ajatavada teaching, just going around saying, oh, everything is illusion and blah, 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 it's not going to help them. It's not very compassionate. It's more or less a self-indulgent kind of attitude. Showing off. Hey, I heard Ramana say this, or I heard, you know, Robert Adams say that, you know, or I read this in the Vedanta. Hey, ain't that cool? Wow, just see, I'm reading cool books, right? <laughs> but have you realized it? So that's the thing. Every religious or spiritual teaching falls on that scale somewhere, fits into one of these five categories. 
And it's a long, long journey <laughs> from Pashu to Ajatta. Huh? Sounds like a song title, doesn't it? <laughs> so, when we encounter any kind of a teaching, one of the first things we should do is put it in context. Is it Ajatta, Vivarta, Vishishtadvaita, Advaita, or is it just another raving mad animal? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody was trying to tell me last night that, oh, technology is wonderful and it's going to save humanity and blah, 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 blah. And I go, you know, every technology has really impacted our quality of life. Every technology degrades the environment. Every technology increases wealth and power inequality. Huh? Every technology is rushed into the market before it's adequately tested. Mm -hmm. And it, its effects are basically unknown, especially long term. So we should be very skeptical of technology. And I gave the example of uh, agriculture. In the old days, the world was open, and one could wander wherever he liked. Huh? Nowadays, look at this. Fences, gates. These are fence posts marking property lines. More gates and walls. Huh? I can't go anywhere I like. I'm not free. Huh? My freedom is very much restricted. There's some beautiful observations on this from Native Americans who roamed freely all over the plains for thousands of years. And then white man comes, starts putting up fences and railroads and power lines. And huh? So this is Pashu, Pashu Vadi. <laughs> the teachings of the animals. Oh, yeah, let's make a new technology. We're going to it's going to make us wealthy, powerful, famous, etc. And then we'll get all the sense gratification that we want. That's animal th thinking. As soon as the idea of God comes into the picture, then, oh, I guess we're going to have to do something to serve God. And that's the beginning of real human life. You know, who, who is it? Uh, Bob Dylan wrote a great song in, when he was in his Christian phase, <laughs> fad, called You Gotta Serve Someone. And, you know, even though it's in that context, it's true. So what is that context? Dueta, duality. There's me and there's God. And never the twain shall merge. <laughs> So uh, in the beginning, that's the way it looks. And then somewhere along the line, you hear, oh, yeah, there's this teaching called Advaita. And Advaita says that I and God are one. But I can't understand that. Huh? But maybe if I do uh, more service, maybe if I develop love for God, God will reveal it to me. And that's Dvaita Dvaita, Bhakti. So you're still in the framework of duality, but there's a, a hope in the future that duality will go away. Uh, and then, by amassing a great deal of merit, punya, huh, good karma, whatever you want to call it, the next stage is revealed when you come in contact with a realized soul, an actually enlightened being like Ramana. And uh, on that platform, you see, oh, there is a sadhana, there is a path, there's a way, there's a truth. And I can reach it by doing this or that process. 
Well, really, there's only two. Bhakti and Jnana. And Bhakti and Jnana are actually one. At least their aim is one. But the two processes look very different on the outside. Now that's all right. Bhakti is sometimes called Jnana Mata, the mother of Jnana. So Jnana, self-realization, has to be based on a platform of Bhakti. Otherwise, it, it just doesn't happen. And this is why most people fail. Huh? They're unaware of this context, and they think that Jnana is a separate teaching from Bhakti or uh, ordinary religion. But actually, they're part of one vast context reaching all the way from animal life or animalistic human life to actual self-realization. And we shouldn't think of these teachings as separate or different huh? because they are part of one context. And now, now you have the context, okay? <laughs> you have the chart, you have the, the map, and you can follow it as you go on your path to reach the higher and higher stages. But as far as practically speaking, you can only see the next step. Uh, you can't see what's beyond that, that next hill, okay? You have to go there. You have to do the journey <laughs> yourself. Otherwise, it seems unreal. You know, for Ramana to say that the self is everything, and I am that self, you know, which is for him a simple direct observation. To us, it seems like really far out heavy duty theory. Huh? So, we have to have, there's a little bit of faith involved, a little bit of trust, really, that, oh, my teacher is not trying to cheat me. He's given me the real thing here. And like I said, this goes all the way back to Shankara, actually all the way back to Vedas, Vedas and Upanishads. You can read these things in the Vedas, these different darshanams, these different vadas or views and you can practice them in your life and then what does that lead to the next step and the next step and the next step until you finally attain the complete and then when you see that you're not limited anymore look at the way Ramana teaches when someone approaches him on Dvaita Vada platform he teaches Dvaita he encourages them he says, yes, go on, huh? Go on with your process, whatever it is. And when someone comes to him to be a disciple, an actual uh, ajatavadi, huh? then they get the, the real teaching. Then they get the whole medicine. Until then, they're not ready. They can't assimilate it. They can't hear it. They can't take it in because, again, they have no context. So these uh, four vadas, these four darshanams, they are the context for all the Vedic teachings, all the yogic teachings. And it always amazes me, you know, when people are studying, quote, yoga, huh, that they don't know any of this. It's like completely mysterious to them. And that is just the illustration of the fact that you can't see farther than the next step. Uh, you can see, but you can know. And that's the value of the scriptures. That's the value of these ancient teachings that they uh, bring you to the point where you can see. <laughs> but you have to follow the map one step at a time. You can't jump. And if you try to jump, you'll just fall down. So 
that hurts. <laughs> Don't do it. Master karma yoga, which means holy service, giving up the results of your activities. Huh? Give to the, not to any ordinary, like homeless person on the street, you know, who's just going to go out and use it uh, for drinking or drugs or something. Give to the holy people, give to the masters, give to the ones whose teaching can actually uh, do some good in the world, you know. And uh, that's karma yoga. See, the word yoga means linking with God. So if you're just giving charity to people, that's nice, but it's karma. It's not karma yoga unless God is involved somehow. So if you give to a holy teacher, a, a sadhu, uh, someone, a devotee, you know, someone who's doing real service for the world, then your gift will be yoga, karma yoga. Uh, but if you're just giving money, <laughs> like, you know, Bill Gates, idiot, yes, more money than anybody, or, or he did anyway. But what is he doing with it? He's funding vaccinations. <laughs> so all you, all you have to do is channel that energy in the right direction. And the right direction means towards God, toward the absolute or towards those who represent the Absolute, huh? to you. Because they're doing you the best service. They're doing the uh, best service for all humanity. Huh? So you want to support them, and that's karma yoga. Now don't be confused. Don't think ordinary charity is going to give you spiritual advancement. It's not. So... Here we are on Girivalam Road, the famous pilgrimage path. And uh, it's just past dawn, or actually not quite dawn, still the Brahma Mahurta hour. And here's many sadhus, guests, pilgrims, students, and other assorted types. You see, it's like Sadhu's downtown Sadhu Central. Hmm? Everybody who's anybody in Tiruvannamalai comes here sooner or later. <laughs> and of course, there's a very good view of the hill in the background. So I hope you've enjoyed this series and I hope you're able to put it in practice in your life. I was going to do <laughs> some musical uh, things today, but uh, it got too complicated. So I wanted to finish up this series on the four vas vadas. And uh, please try to use these categories to think with, to evaluate things that you experience and teachings you encounter and teachers that you run into, you know. It will help. You'll be able to put them in context. And context, after all, is the source of meaning. So if you want to know what it all means, <laughs> then use these categories to classify and uh, understand everything. Om Tatsat. Om Harihi. Om. <laughs>